Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On January 19th, 1955, President Dwight Eisenhower filmed the first presidential news conference for TV, making just one of many historic moments on television in 1955. Another historic moment occurred this year, ultimately shifting the balance of the NFL. And because of TV, the balance of the top sport in America. Because in 1955, the Pittsburgh Steelers made a brilliant move to cut a player that was recognized as Johnny U. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is December 28th, 1958, and we are in New York City at legendary Yankee Stadium. We're here to watch the final two drives of what has been nicknamed the greatest game ever played. Yes, this is the 1958 championship game between the Baltimore Colts and the New York football giants. Johnny Unitas. Johnny U. He shows us why he is widely considered by many as the greatest quarterback and maybe even player of all time. The Baltimore Colts show that they are for real. And because of TV, the NFL starts to take over as the number one sport in America. Of course, there are many other things involved to how we end up getting to there. But football was made for TV. But let's take a step back for a bit. Baltimore has a long history of having some great football teams in the city. However, it hasn't been a gravy train for the Charm City all this time. That's where I bring in this week's guest. Jim Johnson is riding shotgun on the DeLorean with us to share some stories from Baltimore football history. And here's more about Jim. Jim Johnson writes about Baltimore and Washington NFL football history. From Sonny Jurgensen to Lamar Jackson, Jim has witnessed many great, and not so great, football games, coaches, and players between the Beltways, and he wants to tell you all about it. Check out his blog at BeltwayFootballHistory.com, and sign up for his newsletter when you're over there so you can keep up with the latest. And we're about to get into the interview with Jim, but first, I gotta give some love to our sponsor. Play classic sports simulation board games, spelled with two A's, that's P-L-A-A-Y. Realistic board game recreations of professional football, hockey, baseball, NASCAR, golf, and more. They cover nine sports in all, with a tenth, basketball, coming in 2022. You can relive great seasons of the past, create what-if matchups from different eras, and so much more. It's fun! If you're into sports history... You got to go check these guys out. Again, that's play with two A's, P-L-A-A-Y classic.com. When you're over there, here's a pro tip for you. Use the code SHN at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Again, that's code SHN. And of course, we got a giveaway that's running through November 13th. So for your chance to sign up to win your choice of any one of Play Classic Games, And also, to listen to the interview with the founder and his son, you got to head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash play. That's P L 
A-A-Y. Again, there's two A's in this. Play Classic. So go ahead, pause this episode real quick, head over there, enter the giveaway, and bookmark that page so you can go ahead and listen to the other interview later down the road. But now that you're back, let's get into this interview with Jim Johnson. Oh, okay, so we we have the what they call the fresh blood and everything, but you've been writing about football history for quite some time then, or is it you shifted just recently? I shifted just recently. Um, from prob- roughly 98 through about 07, I did mostly college basketball with some college football, and uh, then I kind of walked away for it as my real career took off. And uh, now as I've kind of settled in, I work at home and don't have as demanding a job and I wanted to get back into the game. And it's like, well, I, I don't want to do a beat. You know, I uh, just at that this point in my life, I just didn't want to do that. So and I found a lot of the stuff that I was really interested in reading and, and keeping up with was history. So it's like, OK, there's too much. Pick a sport. And, uh, you know, baseball is so saturated. I was uh, a member of Sabre for a while and it's so much and it's just so much and in football and the pfra you can tell the difference just between the two organizations how well developed the uh, historical archives and writing is and i wanted to be not on the ground floor but you know something that maybe that road hasn't been traveled 50 times before you know yeah, it's kind of cool like that. You said, um, now, granted, I was going to go into football regardless. I mean, when I started my show, I had this idea, let's be a podcaster. Well, I'm going to be the fantasy football dude. Well, there's like a million fantasy football shows out there. And I happen to just enjoy NFL is, is my my primary uh, thing that I follow. And then I got into, I, I just enjoy history, but I never was really specifically football history, except for anything I would catch on the the TV. You know, they talk about the old times and I was like, man, that's super cool. And somehow I stumbled into this and then I hopped in my DeLorean. Here you go. I don't know if you can see this right here, but you're going to hop in this DeLorean with me later. And we go back in time and learn about uh, football history, the gridiron. Um, speaking of that, a writer of, okay, Baltimore football history. Does that mean that you grew up as a Baltimore fan? Actually, no. Uh, I lived in Maryland almost all my life, and uh, I was never one of those. I, I More that time, I lived in the Washington area, although some of the time I was adjacent to Baltimore. But uh, I grew up more of a Redskin fan. But I was never one of those Washington people who, uh, other than just when I was a little kid, you know, a lot of Washington people just really looked down their noses at Baltimore, the city, the teams, and the whole thing. And uh, I always have a great admiration for the parochialism of Baltimore. You know, there, there's always been more of a, a base, for, especially for the sports teams. But, you know, the neighborhoods and all that, everything just runs a lot deeper in Baltimore. And, uh, you know, I've always in, was a fan of the Orioles. Second, you know, I liked the Colts, even though I was more passionately a Redskin fan. But then the Ravens came in. It was was just Providence that came in at the time that Dan Snyder bought the Redskins. And I was one of the fans that he chased off. And then the Ravens were right there, this spunky new team. And then all of a sudden, the championship team, I cannot love that. Beautiful stadium. And, you know, everything works. So uh, it's been, you know, I'm, I'm still drawn there. And uh, that's where my writing opportunities have come. This is, as you probably know, my, my second tour with Baltimore Sports and Life. That works out very nicely. It's a very local-oriented site. The editor there likes what I do. So when I made the pitch of writing history, he jumped at it. And it's like, good. And, the, and the, the Baltimore football history is just terrific. You know, more recent, but then you go back. And I'm actually, I, just in the last week, I started focusing on an idea of, of writing a book of the deconstruction of the Baltimore Colts, 72 to 84. Because Carol Rosenblum traded the Colts for the Rams in 1972 as a tax dodge. It was legal. And then Bob Irsay became the owner. And it pretty much, it went to hell in a handbasket, then it pumped, bubbled up, and then it went and stayed in hell in a handbasket. And there's a lot of different pieces and things that, that happened there. And of course he alienated most of the fan base, which was difficult to do because that fan base is so deep, but there was just, 
but the uh, you know fan base was connected so much to that the Johnny Unitas Colts is that when he got run off and so many of the other players got run off all at the same time, the connection really was never the same after that. And it could have been done a lot differently. And one of the smartest things the Ravens did is they reconnected with those guys. And that really helped a, a lot of the people who were like kind of, okay, so we got our team stolen and we stole somebody else's team. Are we really supposed to be happy about that? But they were very wise in bringing the old Colts back in the fold. You know, Unitas hung around the games and several of the other uh, former players. So it, it was a, a master PR stroke by Modell. Yeah, and you kind of alluded to that. We're going to transition through the episode. We'll probably go a little bit from a timeline perspective, but we'll jump around to here and there. Uh, the, what, I want to dive into a recent article that you had about Johnny U. You cannot talk about the Baltimore Colts without thinking about that name. Uh, as I'm doing the research here, the first sentence that I read of your article, I'm, it just blew me away because I, I may have heard about this before, but I didn't realize. Tell me about the day that Johnny U passed away. Well, you know, it was it was 9-11. It was the first anniversary of 9-11. And, of course, everybody was absorbed in that. And then, you know, um, just kind of beneath that, if you're listening to sports radio or if you're listening to Baltimore TV, watching Baltimore TV, you know, that was the big story that kind of it didn't overshadow 9-11, but it kind of came in parallel. You know, you're honoring that because it was the first anniversary. And then you have the, the Titan of Baltimore sports. And, and it was sudden. He, he had a heart attack and he passed away very suddenly. It's not like he had been ill and there had been any kind of death watch. And he was still only 69. He, he had all kinds of uh, infirmities from his playing days. What, what was sad is he, he couldn't even hold a pen because the, the injury that he got that caused him to miss most of the 1968 season ultimately led to nerve damage. And it got progressively worse over time to where, you know, his hand was kind of like a claw. So that when they uh, ran the final play, they did a ceremonial final play in uh, the last Ravens game in Memorial Stadium. And he just did a handoff because that was all he could do. He handed off with his left hand. But, I mean, it, there was nothing life-threatening. So it was, it was really a shock. And uh, my my best friend, uh, Raman, who I've gone to most of my Ravens games with and a couple of Colts games and all kinds of games you know, all through the years, you know, we talked that day and it was like, you know, when, uh, when you're of a certain age and, you know, your, your heroes start passing away. But really the titan of Baltimore sports, it was, uh, it was quite a blow and, and just such an odd day for it. You know, so you always remember Colts fan remembers 9-11 for two reasons, I think. Yeah, and I so again, I kind of at the beginning of this before we started recording, I talked about the genesis of the podcast. And before I really knew football history or any of that kind of thing, it's hard to grow up being a football fan at all without knowing the name and kind of what he meant. But at the same time, there was no way I, from my perspective, could realize what he meant for the league and the team in that city at that point. I know you said you're more of a Washington fan during that era, but like what, what, what was he like and what did he mean to that city during that time frame? Johnny Nice was such a great fit for that city because he was very quiet, very unassuming, you know, the lunch pail kind of guy, like a lot of the other old Colts. He lived in the city. You, you saw him at the grocery store. Uh, he worked odd jobs in the off season uh, through most of his career because none of them made enough money to be able to do that full time. So they were just such a part of the fabric of the city. And, and Johnny in, in particular was just such a, a comfortable blue collar guy. He grew up in a blue collar neighborhood in Pittsburgh. Um, he was just such a reflection of the best of the city because he was the hero. Baltimore. He was the guy who led them to their first championship in 58, of course, the greatest game ever, which it really wasn't, in my opinion, but it was maybe the most important game ever. And, but more importantly than them being champions, the city was relevant. You know, they did not have a major league team until uh, the Colts in 53 and the Orioles in 54. 
and the Orioles were terrible. And the Colts, their first two or three years were, were not very good. And then they'd gotten competitive a couple of years before that. And, but when they got the championship and it was on such a, a huge stage, Yankee Stadium, you know, the mecca of sports back in the fifties, right? Beating New York and the glamorous New York Giants. People don't realize how glamorous that team was. Of course, you know, everything in New York, especially back in those days was magnified beyond reason, but they had Frank Gifford, uh, you know, they had, uh, Kyle Rogue. they had all sorts of players that were very familiar and they had won the championship two years before the New York giants then became the Buffalo bills because they got to the championship game five years out of six and lost all of them. Can you imagine that now? Well, I mean, you can, if you live to see the Buffalo bills, right? But anyway, uh, all of that conspiring together um, was a boon for Baltimore. And Baltimore all of a sudden became out front of this big boon for the NFL. And then especially when they came back and repeated the next year and they got to have the party in Baltimore. It's like, OK, there's there's no fluke. This guy, Unitas and this team, there were several Hall of Famers on that team. It wasn't just Johnny Yu. But he was the difference between the Colts being the New York Giants or the Colts being the champions. And one of the best things I read about him is that I, I think it was the piece that Frank DeFord wrote in Sports Illustrated. I quoted that a couple of times in that uh, article you mentioned. It's just an amazing piece. Because Frank DeFord, the, the great sports writer, great Sports Illustrated writer, also was a Baltimore native and grew up in Baltimore during the reign of Unitas. So he, he knew firsthand what he was talking about. And he said, whenever United stepped on the field, there was always hope that something good would happen. And that is a heck of a thing to say, especially for a city that was in the 60s going into a very difficult transition, as many cities did. And Baltimore went through one of the worst transitions with uh, economic and violence uh, issues. But through it all, every Sunday, 2 o'clock, there was Johnny Yu, and there was always something to hope for, and the entire city could still bond around Johnny Yu. Yeah, I mean, I, for, before I get into the next one, you said every Sunday at 2 o'clock. Was that the standard time back then? Yes. They, huh, they just- still had blue laws, which drove the networks nuts. And uh, they... Managed to, I, it was somewhere between the Colts leaving and the Ravens coming in that they changed that. But, you know, it, it really, for the home games, you know, they could play a four o'clock game. That wasn't any problem. But, you know, they, they were out of that one o'clock window and it just, it, it really cut down, uh, the coverage that the Colts got when they, you know, they had the, the, uh, set one o'clock, four o'clock games. They, they could never get a one o'clock game at home. You just said, what was it, a blue law? Yeah, the uh, the old uh, they call the blue laws, but it was the restrictive Sunday laws. There were lots of things back in the day, and I caught the tail end of this growing up. Uh, you know, grocery stores couldn't be open. Uh, certain entertainment things couldn't happen. Now, most of those laws went off the books in the '60s and '70s, but that particular law really hung in there in Baltimore. I think it was late '80s, early '90s. So they were one of the last ones. Oh, so like it was more of at the time, maybe initially nationwide, but turned into city ordinances and things like that. Well, pretty much every city had similar ordinances. I think Uh, Baltimore is the only one I'm aware of that had that that restrictive uh, Sunday for uh, athletic competition. Uh, But, you know, a lot of when I grew up in in the 60s, you know, you, you there were very few stores open. There was no department stores open, uh, no grocery stores. You know, you, you could get prescriptions at the drugstore and and a few other things that was about it so uh you know the when when that changed that was that was revolutionary at that time but that one law in baltimore uh hung on for a long long time yeah it's interesting to think how most other games were played at one o'clock but just this one was at two o'clock and how much that could change how many people across the nation might be able to watch that game for any you know for any perspectives Speaking of people across the nation watching the game, and I would imagine, again, this is me putting myself in the shoes of a viewer. The first time I watch 
John Unitas play and someone talking about him, I have to imagine it was just probably a, a unique, thrilling moment, especially for someone that heard about it coming into this, kind of like that anticipation. And someone that, okay, here's an example. Tom Brady goes to the the Buccaneers. Everybody has this example and or this anticipation. What's he going to do there? A lot of people call him the greatest of all time. A lot of other people call Johnny Unitas the greatest of all time. Where do you fall on that line? Uh, I'm very clear that Johnny Unitas is the greatest of all time. Uh, my my number two choice there is actually Joe Montana. I, I put Montana ahead of Brady. But um, when, in you know, Unitas won three championships. And uh, there was this large gap in between them. But... Uh, when he had good teams around him, which was a lot of the time, um, he was the guy who would make the plays. He was the, the cool and, you know, he had more on his plate than Brady because back then, you know, well, bang in the day, you know, um, I hate being like that, but sometimes I can't help it, um, that, you know, he would call his own plays. And that was one of the things he got a lot of credit for in the Sudden Death Championship game, how he mixed his plays. He was a very patient. He could throw downfield. He was also a very patient quarterback. And, but he was the leader of that team. Now, Brady certainly is a leader. But you're going to run across, I think, very few leaders in, in sports that could stand up to Johnny Unitas. And I think that's what separates him. You know, it is so difficult to look at, at especially quarterbacks, the way the game has changed over time. And, you know, you look at uh, the numbers. You can Let's compare Unitas and Brady. There's no comparison. Brady's numbers are just, you know, light years ahead of Unitas. Uh, Unitas threw over 20 interceptions in a season several times, which is – unthinkable now but back then there was not the the three yard out pass which i is the bane of my existence as a fan I just hate that right and and he threw to his backs you know i threw his backs and he threw short passes but he threw a lot more high risk passes and as a result you know interceptions were viewed much much differently Back in the, in the fifties and sixties than they are now. You know, anybody who's thrown 24 interceptions in a season here with the, the type of offenses that they have and the limits on defensive coverage is probably either a bad quarterback or having a bad year. And of course, you know, United's never threw for 4,000 yards. I think he only broke 3,000 a couple of times. He didn't throw that much. You know, they ran the ball, they, they, they mixed their plays, and it was just, uh, just a much different game. But Un- Unitas is the guy, and I, I think that I, I keep coming back to that line that I, I will attribute to the four, and I hope I'm right. There is always hope. And you could say that about Brady, and there are other quarterbacks you could say that, but I don't think there was ever a quarterback any more than Unitas that a whole city put his hope on and a whole city and, and hall of fame teammates looked up to, you know, guys like Lenny Moore, who's in the hall of fame, Gino Marchetti, all, all those guys, they were like, Hey, Johnny, you was the man, you know, game knows game. Right. Yeah. I mean, I had Bill Curry on, Oh man, this is a while ago. The center, well, he played center for him for a little bit. And I can't remember the exact quote, but something along the lines is every game before they would start and this would fire him up. He would, he would just say like, well, two words or something like that. Like, I don't talk is cheap. Let's go. Or something like that. I don't remember what it was. And then they would all just go out there and just, he had that moxie unlike any other person he had ever seen is kind of the, the thing he was trying to get at too. And just someone you wanted to follow. Uh, speaking of quarterbacks, I know there was another one, you know, they had a pretty good run there as far as great quarterbacks there with the Colts. Uh, but in, in between, you know, I'm thinking about, I was trying to figure out if this, I remember going flash forward to the Baltimore Ravens Super Bowl. <laughs> I was, I was doing a Google search, worst winning quarterback in Super Bowl history. And the guy, the guy popped up who I thought would pop up and, you know, Trent Dilfer and, you know, give him credit. He's a professional football. It takes a lot to get there, but any, you know, you make the joke, anybody could have won and been a quarterback and won for that team at that time. But let's go back to the, 
uh, the, the the guard transition from Johnny U to the next quarterback that the Colts had. Who was that? Uh, for a, a couple of years, they had a guy named Marty Domres, and uh, they had traded for him in 1972. You know, Unitas was getting up to 38, 39 years old, and uh, the their backup for several years had been Earl Morrill, who was like a year younger than Unitas. And uh, he had, I, I don't know if he was traded or if they just let him go to Miami. And he, or a moral quarterback, like half the games of that perfect season because Bob Greasy got hurt, you know. Um, so Domries, I think, was probably about a second, third year quarterback. They traded from San Diego and he was a, a solid quarterback. But, you know, oh my God, <laughs> he, he's coming in for you nights and, and, didn't see it coming. It happened with uh, very little warning. Uh, United started the first five games of 1972. They went 0-5. No, excuse me. They went 1-4. and They won the opener. And uh, they really, and, and he had one game uh, against the Jets where he threw for about 370, 380 yards. Only problem was Joe Namath threw for almost 500 that day. It was had an amazing game. So the Colts lost like 44-34. But then the fifth game, they lost 21 nothing, and and just got stuffed by the Cowboys in Baltimore. And Joe Thomas, who had taken over as the general manager when Bob Irsay bought the team in, uh, I think it was July, he said, okay, that's it. And uh, he made a phone call to Unitas in the locker room, said, basically, we're going to bench you. Bye. And uh, he was criticized for that. And he said, hey, I didn't have to call him. <laughs> Which was, you know, the interpersonal skills that the Colts management had in the post-Carol Rosenblum days. And it was just night and day. And you mentioned Bill Curry. He was one of the guys who was the most aghast by that and, and realized just the whole culture of the, the team got flushed very quickly. So Domries came in and Domries actually played pretty well. And uh, I think at one point he'd won four out of five games. And uh, the Colts did show some life there for a while. And then he was the starting quarterback the next year and struggled. And uh, they were they had, uh, by that time, they had traded uh, for uh, the draft pick that got Burt Jones. The new coach, Howard Schnellenberger, got fired because – Irsay went down on the field during a game and said, I want you to put Burt Jones in. And Snellenberger basically told him where to go. So in the locker room after the game, he fired him. He told the team first, then he told Snellenberger that he was fired. And then Jones got into play and had a pretty rough time for a while, but uh, he obviously morphed into a, a, a terrific quarterback, won the MVP in 1976 would have possibly had a great career if the injuries hadn't derailed him starting in 78. You kind of alluded to something there. You mentioned multiple times within the past few question, line of questioning about pre Carol Rosenblum and then Irsay and problems and Bill Curry didn't like the way that the culture went. Let's talk about Carol Rosenblum for a little bit and what he meant in your opinion to like the cult success. Well, you know, and it was interesting because they had to basically twist his arm to invest in the franchise when they reestablished it in 1953. And he's like, eh, okay. Uh, but then once he did, he, he loved it. And he was that old style owner that he loved the players. He took care of them. He, he would loan them money if they needed it. Uh, you know, anything that the, the, the team needed, he would get. He wanted to win. He loved the players. They loved him. Uh, you know, if somebody was sick uh, or a family member, he'd maybe uh, pick up their hospital bill. He was just a you, – you couldn't work for an owner that was more loved than Carol Rosenblum. But the problem was the, the fans in the late 60s got a bit jaded, especially after the Colts lost to the Jets in the Super Bowl which, you know, by most logic never should have happened. The Colts had an amazing team in 1968. The, the, the fans and the press were getting a little edgy with him. And Carol Rosenblum liked to be liked. When he was starting then to push for a new stadium, and that wasn't getting very far. Memorial Stadium wasn't all that old, but 
I, I tell you what, it was never, it was a lousy place to play a football game, in my opinion. The field wasn't good. The, the horseshoe shape of it, I'm, I'm, I'm motioning with my hands here on a podcast. That's helpful. Um, but, you know, half the, the seats that would have been in the 50 yard line were actually in the air because, you know, the open end, uh, was, you know, close to where the 50 yard line would be. So it was just, uh, in, you know, I went to several games there and it's like, oh, okay, we're, we're here, but there weren't a lot of great seats. So he, he had a legitimate cause, but, uh, you know, at that time, it was really before the stadium craze started going. And, you know, as I said, Memorial will still look like, looked at as a reasonably new stadium. So he's like, well, you know, I, I wouldn't mind owning Los Angeles Rams. And the owner of the Rams, uh, had actually talked to him about, because he, uh, had suffered with cancer for several years. Uh, and as he was going through that, he had actually talked to Rosenblatt and he's like, you know, I'd really like you to buy this team when, when I pass away. I know it would be in great hands with you. And he's like, yeah, but the capital gains would kill me, the taxes. So then he was able to get a consortium of people, which Robert Irsay joined at the last minute. And they purchased the Rams from the estate of the former owner, Dan Reeves, and traded them straight up for the Colts. So Rosa Bloom went out to the Rams and became the owner everybody loved out in Los Angeles. Irsay became, uh, in fact, I, I read an article about him recently where uh, I think it was one uh, in 1972, the Sports Illustrated sent George Plimpton to visit Baltimore and find out what in the world had happened to the Colts. He got, he quoted someone as saying about Irsay, he wanted to be everybody's best friend but he had no idea how to do it. Rosenblum was a, I wouldn't call him gregarious, but he was just a person who was very hard not to like. But eventually, you know, he had owned the team uh, 17 years, and it just kind of wore thin with him when they were never able to replicate that level of success that they had when they went back-to-back championships in 58, 59. And, you know, it, it got on his nerves. So he looked for greener pastures and found them. You know, Los Angeles is a pretty green pasture if you're sitting in Baltimore, right? So uh, unfortunately and ironically, in part because he was in Los Angeles, he wound up passing away in a surfing accident in 79, uh, right before the Rams went to the Super Bowl that year. So that's probably something that would not have happened to him in Baltimore is a surfing accident, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, there's there was some kind of controversy I heard about that whole thing, too. I don't know if that was just uh, some kind of rumor where it was like they someone said it was an I'm using air quotes again on a podcast, an accident. What, what was that? What was revolving around that controversy? Um, I'm not sure exactly, uh, to be honest with you. I remember the controversy and the, you know, back uh, it, today we call it conspiracy theory. You know, it wasn't a popular phrase back then. Um, but I, I never really saw any any teeth to it. So as as far as I know, it was it, it was an honest accident because uh, nothing you know, his widow inherited the team, and uh, you know they she owned the team for many years. She's the one that moved them to St. Louis. So um, I you know I don't I don't know that anything anybody benefited actually from Rosenblum's death other than his wife. Right. I don't recall the details, but I something to do with the controversy or I guess, like you said, conspiracy theory, the wife was involved. But that's for a whole nother story, another day for when someone has some information on that. But let's talk about the the move from Baltimore to Indy. I mean, so me growing up again, I've only known them as the Colts for the most part. I only really remember them as I mean, there was a little bit of like the the was it Jim Harbaugh or. I think he played with them the, uh, for a little bit there, but I re- I just remember them as the Colts, Peyton Manning for the most part, and that's what it was. But what about the move? When did it happen? And what was it like in the city, the turmoil during that time oh. frame? Oh, that was a dark, dark period in that city. March 28th, 1984. Uh, I If I have seen the picture of the Mayflower trucks rolling out of the Colts complex in Owens Mills, Maryland, once I've seen them 10,000 times. 
And it was uh, you know, late March. You can get any kind of weather in Maryland. It was actually a little snow and ice, so it was just kind of eerie. What had happened is uh, Irsay had been going back and forth for a long time, uh, soliciting being courted by other cities to move the team. And uh, he had said very publicly and maybe not totally soberly uh, earlier in 1984 that, uh, you know, he had no intention of moving his bleeping team. And if he was ready to do it, he would tell you. And he was talking to the press then with uh, Baltimore Mayor Schaefer by his side. And Schaefer, unfortunately, took him at his word. And that is something that as people dug into Hearsay's background was probably not a good idea because there was a lot of things that he said that turned out to not really be factual. But what was happening is and the, the fear was mounting that he was going to abscond with the team. So the Maryland state legislature had actually, the state Senate had actually passed a bill on the March 27th, I think it was. I might have my days one off, but it was right before he moved the team where they were going to seize the team and declare eminent domain. Now, eminent domain is what you use if you want to build a road through somebody's house and you buy the house at quote unquote fair market value. Okay. It's used for, you know, uh, public facilities. It's used to build stadiums. Very popular for that. But nobody had ever tried to seize a team. And it was up for a vote in the state house, I believe, the next day. So, uh, Irsay's lawyer called him that evening and said, did you hear what's happening? He said, yep, call Indianapolis, we're taking the deal, we're going. And within hours, the mayor of Indianapolis, which is where the headquarters of Mayflower Moving is, had arranged for trucks to get there and abscond with the, the team's, you know, the, the bulk of the team's equipment. And they were hauling out there because they were afraid they were going to get stopped by state cops at the state line. That, that's the paranoia they were running with, probably with some justification, because everything had just kind of come to a head, and it was uh, partially a situation where Hearsay had just uh, alienated anybody and everybody he could find. And the, the state really wanted to try to force him out and get somebody else in as an owner. They didn't want to lose the Colts, but they would have loved to lose Hearsay. And, of course, they wound up losing both. And, and the team, but it was, yeah, nobody knew it was coming. So when you hear uh, the phrase, you know, the uh, Colts snuck out of Baltimore, they literally did. And, but that was the believed to be the driving factor is he was afraid he would get caught flat footed with this eminent domain. And it was not clear that he would be able to survive it. So he got out of town. They passed the law. They tried to go to court with it, but they said, well, you don't have the team anymore, so it's it's not relevant. You don't have standing, as they like to say in court. I had I didn't realize there was that level of, um, I, I don't know, just uh, in a fleet of the night, just out of nowhere, just bam, it leaves, and I didn't realize that even the government was getting involved in and everything. I mean, I seen was it the Chargers? I think it was the Chargers where I saw when they moved and people were outside like banging on the trucks and things like that. I mean, no. Maybe the Seahawks, I, one of them, maybe both, maybe all of them, because, you know, teams and people are passionate about their their franchises. Um, the Speaking of that, so I just had to do a little bit of a Google search because I was trying to figure out when was the first time the Ravens actually played the Colts. And it looks like it was back in 1998, the Ravens played the Colts so in, in, in Baltimore. So it was the first time the Colts came back. Uh, we'll get into the whole Baltimore coming to – the city, but do you remember that game when they first came? Was it a big deal? It was a huge deal, yes. And um, it was a lot of mixed feelings. Uh, now, by that time, Bob Irsay had passed away, and he had uh, left the team to his son, Jim, who was a, a, a lot more grounded. He had his issues, uh, and he came to the game, and he took a lot of abuse, and he took it. You know, he didn't lash out. He just kind of sat there and not physically, but metaphorically took his beating. He, he knew what he was going to get from the fans. Uh, 
you know, there were there were some folks wearing the the old Colts jerseys and and that, and it was just it, it was extremely emotional. Uh, the Colts won the game. That was Peyton Manning's rookie year. He did not have a good rookie year. Colts or the Ravens weren't very good that year either. But it, that was the game they had to win, especially with it being in Baltimore. And the Ravens did manage to to win it. Um, but yeah, it was. Um, it was a very emotional day, somewhat cathartic, I think, uh, especially with the Ravens winning. Uh, the Ravens have not – they had a stretch where they didn't do all that well against the Colts. But that was the one they had to win the first time in, and, and they managed to do it. Well, I mean, when <laughs> – you kind of alluded to it there. They were going against Peyton Manning for a good portion of those time frames for that stretch. So, yeah, I mean, one of the greatest of all time, too, when we talk about great quarterbacks. But let's go back to that transitioning. So, um, yeah, the Colts, they, they, they leave 84, you said. And then the, the city receives a team in 96. And I know you mentioned, you know, should we feel good or bad about taking another team's uh, – you know, another city's team, but – what was it like as far as like, was there this huge, hey, we get a team again? Or what, was it kind of that like you alluded to earlier? Well, it, it was really mixed. And um, I, I remember vividly, and I, I reread about this recently, the announcement of the team. Um, Art Modell had wanted to keep it toward the uh, at the end of the season because he didn't want to disrupt the, the rest of the season for the Browns. Uh, but, you know, News people being what news people are, uh, they got the story and broke it. So uh, Modell basically packed up his stuff and came to the uh, site where the stadium was going to be, where they had a press conference with the governor. And the governor had had no qualms about basically gloating and taking a bow and taking credit, even though he had kind of come in at the end. The, um, the mayor of Baltimore, who was there when they lost the team, had become governor uh, up until uh, a few months before this happened. So the new governor came in and, and was able to, to close the deal, but they had already in place, and this was the key to the deal, they had funding in place for the football stadium right next to the Camden Yards baseball stadium which at that point they were still selling out almost every game. So they were essentially in a Camden Yards parking lot with, with this uh, uh, press conference. And Modell looked like he was giving a eulogy. You know, it, it had really torn him up. And Modell is really somebody who wanted to be loved. And, of course, what he was getting from Cleveland, where he had been for 35 years and had really been in the fabric of the city, all of these nonprofit boards giving charitable money, uh, funding uh, politicians, everything. And his feelings had been hurt because the Indians had gotten a stadium. They had built the arena. They were building the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And he was still there with Municipal Stadium literally falling down around him. So they had essentially taken him for granted, but he had never made the threat. He felt he shouldn't have to. So, you know, they went, went with one of these back and forths, as I'm, you know, again, pointing on a podcast now. But, uh, you know, so the bad blood in Cleveland, well, you know, you know what the dog pound fans are like, right? Well, take that times a thousand, and that's how the city reacted. It was really, really ugly. And then, of course, now Baltimore was in the odd situation of knowing how they felt. Now, what Modell did wasn't as, as underhanded as what uh, Hearsay had done 12 years earlier, but there was still, it was murky, okay? And um, financially, I, I, I studied some about that, and he, he kind of had to. It was not going to happen in Cleveland. They had shot their wad with the stadiums. There wasn't much left. All they were talking about was giving them a fancy renovation, of a stadium that at that point was 60 some years old. You know, not, not a great plan considering he was going to get a brand new stadium with a sweetheart deal, get all the revenue and very little of the expenses, which is kind of standard now, but it was still in the early stages of the stadium war starting and how, you know, cities were attracting or getting blackmailed into keeping a team. 
right? So he was one of the early beneficiaries of the, the wave that really continues the stadium. So, um, so the, the press conference was kind of an example of how the city felt. You had uh, Governor Glenn Denning up there just, hey, we've got a team. We've got a signed contract. Hey, we did a great job. And Modell saying, I feel so badly for the people of Cleveland, but thank you for welcome. You know, uh, that in a nutshell kind of tells you what was going on. And, you know, the they, they never had really any unsold seats, but it took a little bit of time for the enthusiasm of the fans to, to really connect and get over the guilt, you know, kind of, kind of a survivor's guilt. Now, knowing what Cleveland had now, Cleveland made out one heck of a lot better than Baltimore did because the NFL jumped in. They guaranteed them a new, a new team within three years and they got it. They financed a new stadium form, which they built on, on the site of old municipal stadium. I don't know if they tore it down or just let it fall down. Um, and you know, it's a nice enough stadium. They're all kind of the same in, in football. So they were two years without a team and they got a new stadium and they're still mad. And that kind of bothers me because Baltimore not only had to wait 12 years, but, uh, they really got played. A lot. Owners were playing them for their own deals. Um, the Cardinals owner, Bill Bidwell, uh, played them before he moved from St. Louis. Then he played them again when he was trying to get a stadium in Arizona. And uh, you know, several other teams made kind of serious overtures. And then there was the expansion deal where Jacksonville got chosen over Baltimore, which is just basically laughable. And I'm not saying that to find so much fault with Jacksonville. Uh, but, you know, Baltimore was there. They had the plan for the new stadium. They had the fan base. There would have been no guilt getting an expansion team. And it was when they lost that expansion that uh, they changed the uh, leadership of the, the uh, organization, the state organization that was pursuing a team. They said, you know what? Okay, all bets are off. <laughs> We've played by the rules for years. We've gotten screwed. Now we're going to go out and we're going to get us a team. We're going to do whatever we need to do to get it. And they were successful doing that. Yeah, I mean, speaking of successful, they've been a successful organization almost from the beginning. Yeah, they had, like you said, in the middle there some some seasons. But as far as I can recall, I mean, the, they've, they've they're generally always near the playoffs if they're not in the playoffs. That's that's for sure. I think you could say, Arnie, that they're one of the model organizations in the league. Uh, and it's continuity. And, you know, you look at what New England has done and the continuity they've had, obviously, with Belichick. The Ravens, since 1996, have had three coaches. They've had two general managers. Uh, they had a succession plan in place when Modell uh, introduced uh, the current owner, Steve Biscotti, as uh, a part owner and then a plan where he would buy the rest of the team. Everything was just done so orderly. They have great facilities. They have great scouting. They, they basically do everything well. The fan experience is good. They're out in the community. Yeah, they're, I think, clearly one of the best organizations, and that's why they consistently win. When they have a bad year, they generally bounce back. They, they had the worst stretch they've had is probably right after the 2012 Super Bowl. They had a stretch of three years, three, four years, but they didn't make it in the playoffs. But even then, you know, they had one really bad year, but they were still hovering around eight and eight. That, yeah. That's not a bad floor. No, I mean, you're talking to, you might not know this, but the listener of the show is, knows what I'm about to say. You're talking to a Lions fan. So, I mean, totally opposite as far as well-run organization that just is consistent and always it doesn't matter who's there. Um, you say that you had only three coaches at Baltimore since then. We've probably had 12. I don't know. I'm not, I'm just like throwing off the top of my head. But that leads me to, uh, I, I told you earlier, maybe before the recording, I don't remember the time frame here, but my AFC team is the Baltimore Ravens. And the reason why is growing up, I, in high school, when I was in football, that happened to be the same time when they were about to win the organized chaos defense. And then Ray Lewis is one of my favorite. It's, if you ask, 
same as my brother. He's going to tell you Ray Lewis is my brother's favorite 90 Detroit Lions player of all time, at least from the current era, that is. And uh, I was there. Thank- it was awesome because when he got inducted to the Hall of Fame, I was I had my press passes there. It was my first year ever as a podcast. I got to shake his hand. There's some things that, you know, I didn't get to actually talk to him too much because, you know, they got a lot going on. But I, I will always say that, you know, I, I loved Ray Lewis. I know he had some... Um, poor public image at the beginning, but you, you mentioned in our kind of comments here about how you believed his rehabilitation of his public image is one of the best. So let's talk about that because now we're on a personal level for the football history dude here. Okay. (laughs) Well, and you know, obviously Ray Lewis is one of the more beloved athletes in Baltimore history and one of the best, you know, uh, he obviously has to be in the discussion for the best linebackers ever. Um, the 2000 defense that he was the guts of, he was the defensive player of the year. Um, you know, that is in the discussion for one of the best defenses ever. Um, but you know, he didn't start well. I mean, his, his career started out fine, but then he had that problem the year before the championship in the Super Bowl at Atlanta, and he at the at least got in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong crowd. And there obviously the, you know, there were two people that were killed in whatever happened around him. Uh, he was not truthful. You know, I still vividly remember the uh, pictures of him standing in court in his orange jumpsuit. Uh, it, he took it in a way where he let it change his life. And it, I'm sure, just scared the hell out of him. And he became the model citizen, uh, incredibly involved in the community. Uh, nobody ever saw him do nothing. I mean, nothing. And yeah, there are still fans that I hear. You know, when, when I was uh, working in Washington, uh, you know, there's that, still that built-in uh, hatred of everything Baltimore. And, you know, you hear some comments about, hey, Ray Lewis kill anybody recently? Um, but overall, that he became one of the faces of the NFL after that. You know, a lot of people don't walk away from a situation where they're implicated in a – they're charged with murder. And, you know, you get the film of them in the jumpsuit. And then years later, he's taken his bow at the Hall of Fame. He's made a fortune off of endorsements. Everybody wants him to help their cause. Uh, and he is beloved in his city. And he's also a symbol with uh, University of Miami. He's, you know, he's involved down there. He mentors kids down there. Uh, it, it really, over time, when you look back at it and you think of, you know, 2000, and where he is now, the you know now the elder one of the elder statesmen and and role models that the young players are coming up to be, it just really strikes me as remarkable. Yeah, I mean, if I would have not have known about like you said the in the courtroom with the orange jump, so like that story, I would have never even known because he is the quintessential leader type. The uh, motivational, you know, seems humble, down to earth type of person. Try, I, I challenge you as a listener right now, go try to listen to one of Ray Lewis's speeches and and not get jacked up or get, you know, tingly spines or want to go and run through a wall after the, you know, after the Justin Tucker moment, for instance, we'll call, or not. No, that wasn't Tucker back then. Oh, who was the kicker that missed? Or was it Tucker after the playoff game? Okay, yeah, after the miss and then listening to that and then just that's just one example of of a hundred of them and and we could go on and on and again. So speaking of that moment though, I gotta bring this DeLorean out for you again. You're gonna I'm opening up the suicide door here. You're gonna hop in it and the passenger. I'll tell you what, I'll give you the keys. You can write I'll ride shotgun with you. You can go back in any moment in Baltimore football history. You can actually relive that. Like you're part of the moment itself. What moment are you going to? Well, I, you know, it, it's such a cliche, but I think, uh, I would probably go back to the 58 championship game, uh, just to be a part of that scene, you know, um, the, the whole thing with, uh, Yankee Stadium and about 15,000 Colt fans up there. It was amazing how many trains went, went that direction with Colt fans for that game. And just to be a part of something that turned out 
so historic and so pivotal for the NFL. You know, there's, I, I don't think, I cannot think of another sport that has that equivalent of one game, one day where everything turn around and you, 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 you demarcate this is before the championship, this was after. And, uh, so to have been a part of that and to watch, uh, Unitas mar- uh, march the team down the field, not once, but twice to tie it and then to win it. Um, that would have been pretty awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's one answer that I get. I, it's got to be in my top two or three, even for people that might not be a Baltimore history fan or, or specifically of the team. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to caveat this a little bit. I want to, I want to say that you can't say uh, Ray Lewis or John Unitas right now, because that's, that's kind of like an obvious no brainer for some of the guys we talked about, but let's give me the Mount Rushmore of Baltimore football history. Like you could pick only four people you want to throw on that Mount Rushmore. What would it be? Okay. Uh, without those two. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's like, they're, they're already in because even if people didn't think Ray Lewis, cause he's not part of the Baltimore Colts, whatever I, I'm putting him in regardless. That's, that's, I'm, I'm going to take a, what I call executive powers right here. And I'm going to throw him on there for us. Uh, that's fine. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's, you, you've got to look at the hall of famers and there's more hall of famers than you got spots on Mount Rushmore. Um, I think, uh, one name that comes to mind from the Colts is Raymond Barry who um, was a a guy who was not a physical specimen at all. He turned out to be the greatest receiver of his generation. And when he retired in in 67, he had the most catches. He was the lead. Now, he's way down the list, as you can imagine. Um, But he had one leg shorter than the other. He was very nearsighted. He had all sorts of physical challenges he came across. But what he could do is he could run a pass route better than anybody. And when he, the ball got to where he could get his hands on it, he caught it. So with those two combined, he was the most dangerous receiver of his generation. So I think he has to go up there. Um, let's see, who else? Um, I, I'll tell you, not too many players, and I, I don't mean to rub salt in the wound because I'm sure the name Justin Tucker makes you want to hyperventilate being a Lions fan. But uh, – you know, I, I really don't think there's any serious argument that he's not the best kicker in, in the history of football and will probably stay the best kicker for another 10 years. Um, he's, he's just, um, just so flawless and continues to challenge himself. You know, he's wanted an opportunity to take a 66 yard field goal. He's wanted an opportunity to kick a 70 yarder for a while and has made them in practice. But all of the pressure kicks. He might be the Johnny Unitas of kickers. It's an odd phrase. It doesn't quite sound right. But as far as the guy who's, who always, always makes the pressure kick, you know what he said was the most nervous he's ever been for a kick was the extra point he kicked in the Mile High Miracle, the playoff game in Denver in 2012, after Jacoby Jones had scored the touchdown, he still needed to make that kick to tie it. And he said he was terrified that after all that, he would miss the kick. And that was before they moved it back, I think. So it was still the routine, you know, 20 yard kick. Uh, so th- that was interesting. That was after he'd made the 63 yarder and he said, no, nah, the most scared was, you know, you know, was an extra point. Um, as far as, uh, Another one, um, you know, you look at the Ravens, Jonathan Ogden, one of the best offensive tackles. Uh, you know, the Ravens' first draft, their first two picks, Jonathan Ogden and Ray Lewis. You know, you just ought to quit after that, right? I mean, how are you going to beat that? And Yeah, uh, when you're in, if you're in a fantasy football, it'd be like what they call it, just, uh, just lo- say goodbye and log out is what they would say in that <laughs> regard. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, Ogden was uh, uh, just a, an awesome pile-driving tackle. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as, uh, Colts go, I, I would pull back and I would, um, I would have to flip between Lenny Moore and Artie Donovan. Uh, Lenny Moore was a hybrid receiver and runner before that was popular. Uh, and, you know, Unitas again, utilized him probably better than any quarterback of that generation would. And he scored, uh, 
uh, over 100 touchdowns. He, When he retired, I'm pretty sure he had the record for most touchdowns scored. He had a nose for the end zone and also a nose for big plays, which was something kind of common with those Colt teams. And uh, Donovan was a terrific defensive tackle. But, gosh, what what a guy. You know, he's he's a guy you'd love to go get a couple of beers with. You know, and and uh, all the 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 storytelling that he did. You know, he was the Bob Euchre kind of, of football with with his stories on on Letterman. Uh, but he was also probably the the Colts' first really good player, and because he came with the original Colts, and in '53. Now, I think he played up through 62, 63, uh, and, and was a terrific tackle. So off the top of my head, that's how I would fill out the rest of that Mount Rushmore. That's still not a bad team. Even if, even though you take, uh, Ray Lewis and Unitas off of it, it's still a pretty good team. Yeah. It's hard to argue against it. I mean, obviously there's going to be some that you could throw in there and everything, but, uh, let's get into the future. Let's what's on tap. You know, the old what's on tap from Fox sports. I think it was what's on tap for Fox sports in the coming weeks for you, for your writings. Uh, well this week I've got, uh, one I'm really, uh, uh yeah, well next week. I mean, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, I'm going to do a couple of what if stories. And this one I think might be the granddaddy of what ifs. What if the Steelers had not cut Johnny Unitas? Yeah. And I think ultimately it does not wind up as good for the NFL. Because, well, I'm not going to tell you because I ruined the story. Well, yeah, you got to, you got to get into, yeah, there you go. There's our teaser bomb, right? Yeah, there you go. So, uh, but I think ultimately, obviously we're, it's, it's a lot worse for Baltimore. Uh, but I think even for the league, you know, um, somebody needed to make sure that the Giants did not become the dominant team, in my opinion. But then if, let's say if that United's not being in Baltimore, let's say if uh, the Giants win both of those championships. Well, how does that affect those two coordinators they had, Vince Lombardi and Tom Landry? And you just, the ripple effects go throughout the entire league. And just for that one thing, which, by the way, the Colts didn't sign Unitas and say, okay, you're the starting quarterback. You know, he was third string when they signed him. So let's not say that, you know, the Steelers were absolute blithering idiots. Although, you know, it, it, it takes something to miss the playoffs for 40 years like they did. I love reminding Steelers fans of that. You know, life didn't start in 1973 when they started winning championships. They were around 40 years before that. And that's how you get it is you cut guys like Johnny and Ice, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, so that and also, uh, you know, just looking back at some of the, um, uh, the matchups with the, the Ravens. One of the games I'm going to look at is the, uh, that crazy game they had with Minnesota in 2013. The only snow game I can remember the Ravens ever had where there were like six touchdowns in the last three minutes. Uh, and turned what was an absolutely miserable, unwatchable game into one of the, one of the craziest finishes ever. And I mention that because the Ravens are playing the Vikings. Um, so going back and, and looking at some of those features and also throwing in some what ifs. And uh, one of the things I'm going to go back and look at with the Colts is 1967. The Colts went into their last game of the season undefeated. They lost that game and missed the playoffs with one loss. That would be a, definitely interesting for the fan of the show to be able to go and read that. And speaking of that, where can the listener of the show find your work and these articles that you've already written that we've talked about and the ones that are coming? Uh, I write at BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com. It's a uh, overall... Uh, well, Baltimore Sports Site is kind of in the name. And um, they have some really good local coverage. Uh, so I'm right during the season, I'm writing weekly. Hopefully, I'll continue to write in the off season. And I also uh, have a Substack site that I'm working on called uh, footballturfwars.com, which right now all it has is the stuff you're going to see on Baltimore Sports and Life. But there'll be some more stuff coming down the road. So those are the two places you can find it. All right. With that, any last words of gridiron knowledge nuggets regarding Baltimore football history that you want to share with the fan of the show? 
Well, I think it's just it's it's fun to go back and, and you know Baltimore is a great town because it has some some great and not so great but interesting history. Um, but you know, it's just what I'm trying to do and, and what I think you're doing on this podcast, Arnie, is why I was so tickled when you reached out to me is, you know, putting that history out there. And, and I've, I've told a number of people, this There's two reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing is first off for, for guys, my age, you know, I, I started following football in 1968. I was very young, but still, um, you know, going back and either reliving memories or also, or pulling out details that maybe you didn't even know about. But, you know, maybe for somebody your age or younger uh, that didn't know this stuff, you know, that I don't think we spend enough time on the history of the game. I think a lot of it is relevant. And if you look at, you know, that's why I want to do the what ifs, because you can see just how little things, uh, you know, had that, that butterfly effect over everything. And uh, so I think if to really appreciate where the game is now, even though it looks so much different than it did when I first started following it, there's still connecting threads all the way back to when, you know, they they got in the, the showroom of the auto dealership in Canton and signed the first papers in 1920 uh, up till now. It's uh, and it's really, really interesting. And a lot of it is fun to go back and look at. There you go, a little Baltimore football history. And to learn more about Jim's work, you can go ahead to BeltwayFootballHistory.com. And don't forget about that giveaway we're talking about from our sponsor, Play Classic, which is, again, two A's. You can sign up over at SportsHistoryNetwork.com forward slash play. That's P-L-A-A-Y. And when you go check them out over at PlayClassic.com, don't forget to use the promo code SHN at checkout so you can get 10% off your first order. Again, that's promo code SHN at checkout. Now, next episode, we get into a little bit about the other team that Jim writes about, but from a different perspective. We're going to learn about some Washington football history. In fact, we're going to head up the Beltway because we have a fellow member of the Sports History Network, Frank Redding. You may have heard him from, well, Ringside with Redding, boxing history from yesteryear. And if you're into boxing, Go check out his show so you can catch up on all of Frank's episodes. You get that in the show notes or just through your favorite podcast player of choice. That's Ringside with Redding. And for this podcast and Frank's, and don't forget to mash that little subscribe button so you can get the latest, greatest episodes each and every week. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, Please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.